fair markets work. Unfair markets really don't. Okay. Okay. Fair markets work. And what makes a market fair? Fair market is when the rules are set so that the integrity of the product that that market is purporting to support are protected. So in this case, we're talking about the organic market. So the rules uh, set by the NOSB, the National Organic Standards Board, and um, in service of the National Organic Program, uh, really need to set the bounds of what's a fair market, and, and that also needs enforcers or enforcement. And unfortunately, that's really all fallen out. We don't have sufficient enforcement of this. Um, and a lot of key interests are making a lot of money, uh, and it really makes me wonder if the desire is there for enforcement to occur. Yeah. Welcome to The Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lynn Lee Dixon, co-director of The Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish organic crops grown in healthy soils and organic livestock raised on well-managed pasture. You just heard from lifelong organic farmer Ben Dobson of Old Nut Farm and board member of Regeneration International. Ben sat down with my co-director, Dave Chapman, to share his thoughts on two subjects he's been thinking about a lot, the rise of the regenerative agriculture movement and the role of tillage in grain and vegetable crops. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. Um, I'm really pleased today to talk with Ben Dobson. Ben, welcome. Thank you, Dave. It's great to be here with you. So we have so much to talk about. We've been talking for hours. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll miss a lot of it. There's too much ground to cover. But um, just briefly, if you could just say kind of what you do, like how, how did you get to this room? What, what's your experience with farming and all of that? Sure. I, I, my journey with farming started in the womb on a small organic farm. And actually for the past two years, I too have been trying to think through just what to do uh, because for the last year, it's my first time not managing a farm. So what I do day to day is I manage Hudson Carbon, where we study the climatic and ecological impacts of different agricultural practices or systems. We've really been working on how to measure the impacts of organic farming uh, and so-called regenerative farming on soil carbon stocks, hydrology, biodiversity. But what got me here was organic farming. I was born on a small organic vegetable farm. Um, I managed larger and larger organic vegetable farms. I worked and then worked after I sold my salad company and tropical fruits. Uh, and then for the past 10 years, I've worked in the Hudson Valley on mostly organic grain rotations. So we can, I was hired to convert a pretty sizable piece of land from conventional to organic production, where we integrated livestock and grains um, as our major way of transitioning from uh, conventional agriculture. So I've, I've 20 years of agricultural experience already, and now really thinking through what how can we help the movement through what we do at Hudson Carbon? So uh, before we get into Hudson Carbon, I'm just kind of curious, how, how did that transition go to take a piece that was farmed conventionally, I assume, for a long time? Yeah, this far as farmed, well, A, had been cleared and farmed starting with the Dutch. It's in the Hudson Valley. The Dutch showed up 400 years ago. Uh, so some of this land had really been farmed for a long time. And the it, the transition i would say went pretty as well as it could go but we had very mixed soil types from ranging from heavy clay to light sand we had a 60 year 50 year legacy where there had been no animals on the land so no grazing very little manure mostly conventional grains uh, this farm had brought grain corn and soybeans to our county as an example of, of you know, the new type of farming that could work as dairy went out of business in our area, largely in the 80s and some in the 90s. Um, there are a few left, but not many. Um, the transition when there were successes and failures, what was successful is that we, we were able to get the soils to deliver nutrients, uh, hold water and grow crops organically in a pretty short period of time. 
I would say there were some of the one of the failures was economically we couldn't make money while having during the organic transition, um, and even after it was hard. And some of that was the context of this. This is a farm owned by a, a family managed by you know I worked for a family office. Uh, I think I had a lot more liberty than many in that situation. Um, but I'd say that even if it had just been a family farm at that time, prices were plummeting for organic every single year from the time we became certified organic until I left my management job uh, last year. Each year, grain prices declined organic, um, which I think coincides with a lot of what you're seeing at Real Organic Project. Um, in Why the, was that? That was really because of uh, infl an influx of um, fraudulent grain that really isn't organic. The organic industry grows, so-called you know, organic food in the United States. That sector grows 10 to 15% a year pretty steadily. But for some reason, the amount of land uh, in organic, uh, sort of in organic production in America has not changed. So we import a lot of organics. Um, specifically, we import a lot of grain to feed what is called organic meat and milk in our country. And unfortunately, a lot of that grain is not organic. Wow. Okay. Okay. So that was part of the transition. The economics were challenging. Um, I would say that culturally, it was overall a success in that this farm had been considered a crown jewel of the conventional farming community. And we managed to keep it looking good while being organic and in many ways improve it. People didn't, weren't used to seeing all the colors of cover crops and a real rotation of organic life playing out across a landscape that used to just be corn or soy and in the winter a dead gray or brown. So it changed the look and uh, there's a lot more organic land, not just what we changed, but there's a lot more organic land now in Columbia County, New York than there was uh, when we set out with this transition in the fall of 2013. So I think that it's been a win overall for our local ecosystem and community. And we set up a grain business to supply small farms who raise pastured livestock, poultry, eggs, um, pork, and to sell cover crop seeds and barley for malting, bread for baking, all within 100 miles of the farm, most of it within 50. So we really built a baseline input that was needed by the local, burgeoning local community of small farms providing food directly to people. And I think that was a great success. Um, and I think that the economics of grain were really laid bare for me. And I think that also some of the real struggles around land tenure were laid bare for me um, and that this was a very large farm owned by one family and they had very good goals that they still have and have done a lot of great work but ultimately we're in an area where there's a land access problem for a lot of uh, farmers who'd like to start farming naturally or organically for the local food market and I often felt at odds with myself about being the manager of this 2,000 acre farm knowing that there were many farms who were looking for 20, 30 acres to, on which to farm organically. So I, I think that that became an interesting question later on in my management, but that overall the focus of rebuilding a local food system uh, or built around the base inputs and them being grown organically was a success. It seems like there's a, uh, the challenge that we all have is, is how do we connect um, the economics of farming with the uh, social needs and desires that we have. You said that used to be a lot of dairy and then the dairy went out. What, where did it go? Why did it go away? Sure. So I, people I sh still drink milk, right? I should point out that there aren't really many fewer cows in Columbia County than there were 50 years ago. There's one dairy that milks over 3,000. We used to have over 100 dairies that milk less than 100 cows. So, um, you know, a lot of those cows are really just on one big farm. And a lot of the dairy has also moved to Western New York where there are also very large dairies, um, with thousands of cows milked on one farm. And the feed to feed those cows is grown in large, uh, sort of think of the dairy where the cows are milked as the epicenter. And if you draw a concentric circle, some of these places are growing their own corn 20, 30 miles from their home farm. Uh, and then buying in a lot of feed as well. So our dairies have, we have just as many cows, but the dairies are usually in one place now, in you know, a one large farm. 
equals what used to be 40 or 50 farms 50 years ago. So how's that working out for us? Is that, uh, I, I'm assuming that, that this shift in scale has made the milk cheaper. Yeah, in relative terms, you know, milk is much cheaper than it was. Um, the farms we do have, they, the way they farm is with much larger equipment. So they'll come in and one day plant the corn and you might, you might catch the moment where the chemical spray rig is spraying herbicides or applying fertilizers. And then you might catch the day later in the year where they chop the corn. Um, the day you usually do catch is the day they spread the liquid shit because you can smell that even if it's not the same day. Usually that smells for a long time. Uh, and those are sort of the three things that happen on a huge portion of the land base. It's very industrialized. You don't, the average person has no idea who the farmer is. Um, uh, and, you know, it's corn and nor is there any connection of what's being grown in that field and where, where does that food go? What cow, who are the cows that eat it? Well, they're usually pretty far away and they never go outside anyway, so you wouldn't see them. So we're very, we're living even in a rural area in a very disconnected way from the farmscape around us. Um, and it, it often smells bad. And to someone like me, I see the runoff in the streams. I see the lack of cover crops, the lack of birds of prey. And it, it, I'd say it's, it's turned out pretty in a pretty unfortunate way. Um, and, the, and no one seems to be getting any healthier. So f food has gotten cheaper. Healthcare costs are going up. The environment is more compromised. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to wrap my head around the fact that the world is changing right in front of our eyes, but, but it's very hard to see that it's changing. It has. And it, I can see it, but it, I'm very unique. I grew up with parents who were part of the Back to the Land movement. And I was raised on the principles of we need to grow our own food so that our bodies can be healthy. We need to be careful about the intentions of a, a powerful medical establishment. And, um, and chemical agriculture, chemically driven agriculture, as I was a kid, I called it chemical farming. There was organic farming and chemical farming is what I knew. Um, used chemicals to fertilize the plants and to, to kill um, pests and problems. And that, and that this was going to lead to something that, like what's happened today. Um, this is sort of my parents' prophecies. And, and so I've always been paying attention and it's happening at a dizzying speed where when I was a student in school, there were you know often one or two kids in the class with special needs. Or now when I send my kids to school, it's a huge portion of the class who have special needs. Um, one thing that hasn't changed and has probably gotten worse is that the food is industrialized food with a larger and larger approved of allowed chemicals to be used in the growing of it. And that those chemicals have had a mutual impact on a landscape. It's much more homogenized um, and on our human bodies collectively. And while food is cheaper, we have the most exp we have the cheapest food relative to any other industrial nation, industrialized, you know, wealthy quote wealthy nation, and the most expensive healthcare. And when you look towards the countries in the of the so-called developed world, with a um, where they have more focus on what people eat and what isn't allowed to be applied to food, they tend to have much lower healthcare costs. And we're at such a breaking point that I really think it's time for people to connect what's happening to our climate and our landscape to what's happening to our bodies and our, our families. So uh, one of the things that, that is a, a policy in America is cheap food. It, it is a, 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 a literal federal policy that we want to make food cheap because it keeps people, uh, if not happy, at least not rioting. And... But it, it occurs to me that the idea that food is a single thing, that you know, cheap food, expensive food, it's the same thing. So we don't want expensive food because only rich people can afford expensive food. But if you say, well, some food is really not that good for you, then maybe it's not such a good deal. Yeah, I think there's two ways you need to think about it. One is there's the cost of the food then there's the cost of eating the food. So it might be cheap right now to obtain this thing, 
but it's going to be a really expensive long-term deal that I make by eating it. Or I might spend a good bit of money right now to eat this thing, but I'm going to feel good tomorrow. And I will have delivered key nutrients to my, my organs and my brain that I need to, to live a productive life. And I think that the other thing that we do in America is we cheap food as a policy. And now even our policymakers refer to agriculture as ag, A-G. Uh, and I haven't really found what that word means anywhere, but uh, that's what everyone calls it now. But the origin of the word agriculture was the culture around the production of food. And everywhere in the world, people's cultures evolved around the way they produced food, what they ate, and the cultural meaning of those dishes, which often had seasonal influences, um, were close, more closely linked to the climate and ecosystem they lived in. And I think we've come so far from that in America that what instead we have is food is the singular thing. It's basically calories derived from corn or soy for the most part, maybe some wheat, that needs to be cheap. So that, uh, and, and most of it's sugary. And the side effect have, has been um, physically and mentally compromised people and in, in a very divisive time where people are choosing issues to be divided by it, but there seem to be missing the big issue of what they're putting in their body every day and how that affects their health and the health of the ecosystems that determine the climatic conditions they live in. When you talk about the challenges of being a grain farmer, the, the financial challenges, those are uh, due to the low pay price, which are due to the competition and you're saying the problem is it's not a level playing field. That the, the stuff that you're competing with often actually isn't organic in the first place. Exactly. This is a tremendous problem. So traditionally organic prices would be two or three times higher than conventional ones. And the way I look at it is it covers the true cost of production. You know, we're not contributing to, we're not spraying herbicides or fungicides. We're supporting natural levels of insect and bird populations. We're not using synthetic nutrients that are harming our water or soil. It's, it costs more to produce organically. Um, and when there is a level playing field, those costs are, are covered by the price with some margin on top. But what happened is when cheaply grown conventional product from often um, Eastern Europe uh, where we have the, where the war in Ukraine is happening right now is often a source of some of this grain, uh, but really it comes from all over the world. And it's relabeled usually in a third party port outside of the United States. And then it arrives here with certi organic certified papers as organic grain. But the cost of production on that was the conventional cost of production, which is about half as much as organic for a lot of reasons we could get into. Um, and when that grain started being labeled as organic, of course, they could, the way they got market share was by undercutting the organic price. And that continued on and on. And now prices have tipped back up a bit. Unfortunately, that's due to a conflict, a geopolitical conflict in the Ukraine. Um, but uh, we still haven't addressed the root of this problem. Yeah. We, fair markets work. Unfair markets really don't. Okay. Okay. Fair markets work, and what makes a market fair? Fair market is when the rules are set so that the integrity of the product that that market is purporting to support are protected. So in this case, we're talking about the organic market. So the rules uh, set by the NOSB, the National Organic Standards Board, and um, in service of the National Organic Program, uh, really need to set the bounds of what's a fair market, and, and that also needs enforcers or enforcement. And unfortunately, that's really all fallen out. We don't have sufficient enforcement of this. Um, and a lot of key interests are making a lot of money. Uh, and it really makes me wonder if the desire is there for enforcement to occur. Yeah. So integrity of government's an old problem. And uh, I think integrity of organic is a relatively new problem. Um, when organic was uh, a movement without a strong economic base without a big profit motive. It was fairly idealistic. And I think the integrity by and large was there. As it's grown, it's become very attractive to large corporations. 
could we talk a little bit about regenerative as a market that's becoming more attractive for large corporations? Absolutely. I want to step back a little bit on the organic, though, because my parents are part of this movement and I got to grow up as a kid, a child of it, is that it genuinely, I would really want to reiterate what you said, is it generally grew out of a desire for people to live a healthier life, to have healthy children, a healthy ecosystem around them, and to support all life around them while producing food. And it got such traction that it's now a huge industry. And to your point, unfortunately, it's very rare. The gold market was never very altruistic. This really just had to be real gold. The more pure, the more valuable. The organic market became a market because of those altruistic goals. And now we have basically people wanting to feel healthier or wanting to do better for their kids are being manipulated by, by much larger interests that want to make money off this organic idea. So fast forward to the regenerative question is now, and I got caught up in it a, in a bit too, is there's this thing called regenerative agriculture. Still undefined. There's no federal definition for regenerative agriculture. There is no state level definition for regenerative agriculture. It's an adjective. Um, and it's an adjective that is being, is being very useful for major players in big food who've been part of our ecological and health problem for a long time. One might say the drivers of the problem now are using the word regenerative to describe some of their new goals. And those of us who are in, who have been in the regenerative movement for a while, and many of my predecessors, such as yourself and others in the movement, the organic movement or the holistic management movement, really meant the right thing. We need to regenerate the surface of our planet. We need to regenerate the health of our soils and regenerate our ecosystems if we as a species and all life on Earth stands a chance to live. Instead, regenerative now still doesn't have a different definition. And all of a sudden, major players such as Cargill or Bayer Monsanto are, are kicking around the word regenerative. Um, and it's really distilled down to this idea that no-till agriculture, where you do, that tillage of all soil is horrible, and that but so if you use no-till, which requires chemicals, that's good, and no-till is even better if you use a cover crop with it. Um, but whether the crops are GMO or not doesn't seem to matter. Whether they're genetically modified or not, whether there have been multiple chemicals sprayed on the crops or the land itself doesn't seem to matter. Uh, and you don't see, you don't hear very much about how liquid animal slurry from CAFOs is managed or liquid or nitrogen getting into our water or into our air. So um, it seems that the word regenerative is a way for no-till agriculture with a bit of cover cropping, cover cropping to take the stage as a real climate solution. And now the USDA started this grant program called the Climate Smart Commodity Program. And in a way, uh, in many ways, looking at who won those grants and what I thought, oh, wow, this might be, they might be really interested in grass milk or hemp or organic vegetables as climate smart commodities. No, what they meant is how do we make the existing commodities we trade in climate smart? And they put a lot of money into this. And unfortunately, a lot of collaborators and friends, um, people I really respect, partnered with people I really don't. Um, one party I know won a grant in conjunction with Cargill, but it's all regenerative, I'm told. And um, so I, that's my long-winded answer is this regenerative thing has come along and I too am confused. But what I'm seeing, put simply, is an emergence of conventional no-till agriculture being billed as a regenerative climate smart solution and potentially another generation of corn and soy um, having its way. Okay. Well, there's a lot there. Um, first of all, you say they're spending a lot of money. Whose money? Our money. Our taxpayer money. Right. So the climate. How much? Three billion. It was going to be one billion, but they had so many grant applications come in that they allocated three billion to it. Okay. So the USDA gave away three billion dollars for climate smart agriculture in an effort to, in an effort to heal the gaping wound of, of agriculture's impact on climate. Yeah. And the basic solution that they saw was what? No-till 
production with some cover crops in the process of making corn, soybeans, wheat, and dairy. They think, so they did not look to the solution as, oh wow, maybe the construct of a, a government that uses corn, soy, wheat, and you know, big protein, big milk, big meat, as a way to feed our country cheaply and a way to have a negotiating chip over other countries. It's a big part of our foreign policy, this cheap food as well. Instead of saying maybe that policy has wreaked havoc on our own ecosystems and many other ecosystems like the Brazilian rainforest, it was more like, no, why don't we see how we can make these commodities more climate smart? And what they came up with was, well, let's support no-till agriculture with some cover cropping. And that seems to be, they're looking at some other solutions, but their real serious focus is seeing more acres converted to no-till or with cover crops. But that, the, that those acres are still producing high levels of corn, soybeans, or wheat. This seems to be a fairly stark contrast to the EU's farm to fork initiative, which is imagining a very different approach to how agriculture might be transformed to be a greater benefit to the world? It is. It is. Um, in the EU, a um, healthcare costs are borne by the, the taxpayers. You know, they're generally of socialized medical systems. And those systems now cost a lot less than American healthcare. But therefore, the governments there have a vested interest in a, in a healthy population. It keeps the cost of healthcare down. They've also, I think, been through so much more in Europe in the last century that they haven't forgotten that the idea and, and in, in the EU, there's a lot of cultural identity is connected to farming and the landscape. And a lot of one's cultural identity is connected to what they eat. And even uh, if Italy or France's GDP might be lower than ours, the average person there has a greater appreciation for good tasting food and the value of good food. And I think that the base, the cultural baseline was there for Europe to make its farm to fork initiative, which is they would like, there's a, the EU commission has set a goal of 25% of the land in the EU to be certified organic by 2030, which is uh, pretty amazing to think about coming from our movement is the US hasn't broken beyond two or 3% of our land being certified organic, despite the fact that the industry is growing on paper as mostly on fraudulent grain and imports, um, where the EU is looking to come back home. And even if food gets more expensive, having that healthy food produced in their own backyard, they see the connection between how that uh, impacts the health of their own people, but also the health of their own ecosystems that support their climate. And they've really made the strong connection between climate and ecological health and the human health. And their agricultural policies are reflecting that. And in the United States, we just don't seem to have gotten the memo yet. Um, and it, in, we have to remember that America, we print the world's money. And we have the military to enforce that. And that cheap food is a critical part of that formula. It's critical to have cheap food at home so that Americans sort of unwittingly or blindly support what we do. And also, with free trade agreements, we can flood other countries and have flooded many other countries with cheap food. And once they become reliant on our cheap food, then we have bargaining power with those countries. Uh, and that is the case of the United States today. So this cheap food is an intrinsic part of our foreign policy. Um, it was really a foreign policy that we've all lived in since the end of World War II. So when we talk about changing it, I, I, we're talking about changing something much bigger than just oh, you can't use that GMO seed for the corn. That's connected to something much bigger. So our, our climate policy is unfortunately not, we were ho I was always hoping that our climate work would bring more foresight and say maybe we need to rethink our foreign policy as a, as a nation and our domestic policies. And maybe we should communicate to our people that we want to cut your healthcare costs, but your food cost is going to go up. But we have not... Um, we have not uh, looked down at our moral compass long enough to get there. Yeah, it's not even just a moral compass. It's actually uh, self-preservation. Uh, yeah. You know, it's just a question of whether maybe certain people will come out enormously uh, uh, 
wealthy as a result of maybe making a bad choice for the for the group. Let, let, let's go back to um, this thing about tillage. This has become a huge topic of national discussion. And we see uh, even people who are really strong organic advocates going, well, maybe it's a mistake to till the soil. Yeah. So what do you think about that? You've seen, you've seen long-term no-till trials. Uh, can, you, can you talk about what do you think? What have you learned? Sure. I'm going to go back all the way to my childhood. My mother farms with horses. A little less now. She finally got a tractor and she's a little older. Um, but we started with soil with 4% organic matter and it's now above 10. And we tilled every year with the horses. But before tilling, we'd add a healthy layer of compost on top of cover crops and till that cover crop in with compost on top. And that resulted in a tremendous amount of carbon adding, building up in her soil. And the note, and we've had, we have a, tillage has a pretty bad legacy overall, but it all comes down to what you're tilling and why. So the no-till movement is in response to conventional tillage, which is where every year to grow your corn, soybeans, or wheat, you would till with really big equipment. You'd till in the stubble from the last crop and plant the next one. And in between those tillage events, there was no cover crop. There was no addition of compost. None of the things that help revitalize the soil. There was just the crop, the chemicals, the inputs, and then you till it again to do it over. And a lot of those farmers have moved to no-till, where now they just don't till. They can just use chemicals and a planter and a harvester and get the job done. And they're seeing less erosion, which is good. They're seeing more soil staying in place and seeing some upticks in the very top layer of the soil in their organic matter. The deeper layers, not seen evidence yet on paper that no-till agriculture without a lot of deep rooting cover crop and minimal chemicals really does much in the deeper soils. Um, so no-till has made some marginal improvements and they have a lot to point to. They can point to the dust bowl as something that tillage caused, but you can also be an organic farm where you use compost that's rich in carbon and cover crops that are rich in carbon and tillage is your way of getting those things into the soil where the soil microbes will eat them, compose them or assimilate them into the sort of soil microbiome and tillage is the way you get that stuff there. So if you're tilling in and using inputs that are building the health of your soil, then tillage is your, your technique for incorporating them. Um, so it's a very important to talk about tillage in terms of what are you tilling and why. Has this been an evolution for you in your thinking? Was there a point where you went, oh, I get it, tillage is wrong, I'm just curious. Absolutely. It, yeah. So I, I've, I'm guilty of over tillage. I had a salad farm and we would make these perfect beds that we could, as flat as that table there, and we could harvest it with a bandsaw mill. 21 rows of salad crammed on 40 inch bed, 41 inch bed tops that would deliver a lot of thousands of pounds of salad per acre. And I would level the field of the land plane. I'd rip up the beds I'd, with a, a form them with a lister. I'd rip them so that all the subsoil was equally loose. And then I would mulch them with a the tiller. Then I'd add compost, mulch again, and then I'd press them and plant them. And I'd do that two or three times on the same acre in one year. And if I was lucky, get a rye cover crop in, adding compost the whole while, still was losing organic matter in soil. And a lot of that was economic for the amount of uh, debt I had and the amount of demand I had. I didn't have the land base I needed to rotate properly. But after I sold that business, I was really burned out on tillage and farming. And I went to work for a biodynamic banana and mango farm who didn't till because they grew perennial crops and they grazed cows underneath. And it was a beautiful system, although they would till every 10 years 12, to replant bananas. And we tilled to set the... What was this? This is called Horizontes Organicos founded by Christoph Meyer, who's a pioneer in the biodynamic movement. He was the founding farmer at Hawthorne Valley Farm in New York State, an old friend of my family's. Um, so I got to go to the sort of no-till organic system. And then a couple of years later, I uh, started working at Stonehouse Farm in the Hudson Valley, where they had gone, con with the con farm we converted from conventional. And I worked with the team there who had worked for many years. Um, 
I really liked the former farm managers there, and they had gone from conventional to no-till conventional, and they loved that. So I started with them by adding cover crops, and since we had so much residual herbicide, our organic no-till was kicking ass for three years. We had beautiful soybeans and corn coming up through these rolled and crimped cover crops, and we just were the aces of organic no-till agriculture, and this regenerative thing was seeming realistic. And then like four years in, the weeds started coming. And especially in the soybeans, the no-till soybeans were having trouble. We'd had trouble on clay soils with uh, no-till organic corn. And then once the weeds came, we were like, I had to till more to kill the weeds. And so like, well, I didn't, have to, I didn't till to put the no-till crop in. I took a bit of a yield, a yield hit to grow the no-till organic crop. And then I had to till afterwards anyways to get rid of all these weeds. So the net impact was, was not what we wanted. So we really moved towards a longer rotation that incorporated perennial crops. So where we would use alfalfa and blend, based blends on the lighter soils and much more grass-based blends on the heavier soils. So and when we hit the small grain portion of the rotation, we'd spray the, spread in the springtime those perennial seeds in. We didn't have to till, we'd harvest the small grain and there was a perennial crop that we'd graze and hay for two to four years. And then we would plow and till back in to grow corn. The whole time we founded Hudson Carbon as part of this transition to measure the changes in soil carbon dynamics up to a meter deep. And what we found was that extensive tillage does hurt carbon values. Um, but that extensive use of cover cropping and especially perennial cover cropping builds carbon values even with tillage, especially deeper than the layer of the soil where you're tillage by introducing new roots and compost and microbes gets down to that deeper layer of the soil and you build a bigger carbon bank on an organic farm. So measuring not just the top six, seven inches. Exactly. This is the, the greatest scam of no-till is the, the, these new sort of carbon credits for uh, no-till farming. They only measure the top eight to 12 inches. That's what the modeling tools are built on. That's what the research studies did. They don't measure the deeper soil. Some studies that have pointed to deeper soil research show, and in our own research of an adjacent conventional site, showed those, dro those values dropping, where, where our values between 30 and 100 centimeters uh, on every carbon site grew, um, even in sites where we tilled. So it's really, really interesting to see um, the true impacts of tillage in systems. And you have, to look, you have to look deeper into the soil, and you have to look over time and we had years where we lost carbon from tillage because there wasn't enough cover crop or compost that went into them. That's really about what you're tilling, when, and how much tillage you're doing. But I don't think that there's a way to do good organic farming and, and do no tillage. If you're, you know, there, you may be able to do so at a small scale or with extensive compost mulching. There are techniques, but when we get out on a land scale of a couple thousand acres of grain and forage, we found that some tillage was necessary. Not every year, and you could take years off, and you could build soil carbon, but we did need to use tillage. Yeah. I am reminded of uh, that saying that for every complex problem, there is a, a simple solution <laughs> that is wrong. <laughs> you know, that, that, that these are complex, very complex, biologically complex systems, and that we need to not approach them as children saying, oh, I got an idea, but, but what's going on? And, and the answers aren't easy. It requires, well, that's what you're doing with carbon, Hudson Car Carbon, is you're trying to appreciate more sophisticated and subtle answers to these questions. Exactly. We started Hudson Carbon before the carbon and agriculture discussion was cool. And then we watched sort of in dismay as we got close to launching ourselves and more commercially the space really was suddenly taken over by what we felt was a greenwashing effort, where simplistic process-based models to estimate carbon changes from conversions of conventional tillage to conventional no tillage with the addition of a little cover crop centered around the focus of commodities, what became the focus of this sort of these agricultural soil carbon or climate spark schemes. When the truth is that carbon dynamics are really complicated and that there are soil types, soil depth, bulk density, um, your microbial populations, what types of carbon are, are, be, are increasing or decreasing, 
uh, are all factors in this, not to mention the climate we live in is a key factor. Um, but some key findings we've found is that soil carbon does best under perennial cropping situations. So it's that you know, we on our farm, the soil carbon in the forest adjacent to the field, same soil type, was often two to three times higher than the field. So a forest does a better job, but we need to grow food. So we found in food systems that um, organic systems we feel and have, have some data to support, uh, build more carbon in soils. And after all, organic farming, the word organic, refers to uh, carbon-based life. Uh, and when, when Sir Albert Howard and J.I. Rodale and all the real founders of the word organic, they meant adding organic matter to our soil. We had no USDA organic program. They meant that by adding more organic matter, we, we eliminate the need for herbicides and pesticides. So that's really where we, I'm sorry to kind of come back around to a, that with that answer, but I feel, I feel that that's really what we're here to, what we've come with our research to support is, um, we like to say we're trying to advance organic agriculture and by researching themes that have gone unresearched so far. Yeah. Yeah. There, there seems to be a, a very uh, kind of full court press from a certain industrial community to discredit organic and promote what they call regenerative. And I know that means different things to different people, but it certainly means something in particular to Syngenta and Pepsi and McDonald's and, and Cargill and Bungie, you know, and Bear. So what they mean by regenerative is being used as a way of uh, undermining popular support for organic. Do you believe that's true? I do. I think that organic is now a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. Globally, it's somewhere between 300 and 500 billion dollars. Um, and the reason it's that is because people want to buy something that's healthier for their children, that they perceive to be free of chemicals, grown in soil, and grown on family farms. That's the general perception. When people buy organic food, they think of a, a, a family farm with healthy soil, with pollinators, and creating some healthy food that they're going to feed their kid. Um, and I would add an animals not grown in confinement. And animals that are happy. So they're thinking of happy animals. Uh, they're thinking of you know, a farm that works with the environment to produce healthy food, farmed by families. And that is a real affront to industrial agriculture. And I think that they will, uh, they will attack organic until the standard is so watered down that it fits all of them. And I think regenerative was a great way to say, hey, instead of organic, why don't we use the word regenerative so that people think we're organic? And then they'll buy our stuff instead. Or, or they'll just keep buying our stuff because we're good now and we'll be cheaper than organic. So it just, it's about perpetuating a system that's really bad. And it's, they've always been looking for a spin. And the most of this recent regenerative spin is pretty lethal. Uh, it even got me, and I was born on an organic farm. I was, I, you know, I was thinking, ah, oh, well, I got a little ho-hum about the organic standard. It's always certified organic as a farm. Um, but really was like, oh, this regenerative thing is really exciting. We can get a lot of people signed up. And what, then now I, now I look at it like, well, regenerative went big because big media got involved with regenerative at the behest of some really big industrial interests. And now watching that it's sort of being formalized at the level of the USDA with this climate smart commodity program um, and watching who wins. Uh, it certainly feels like us in the organic movement are losers here. And we really need to get back out in front of this and show our eaters a movement, you know, our eaters who are, I think there's over 100 million, 200 million people have had something organic in the last year and 50 million who eat something regularly that's organic. And probably 10, 30, 10 to 30 million of us who eat mostly organic. In the U.S. In the U.S. alone. That's the audience that needs to be educated about, well, the standards for organic are getting watered down, so it's not supporting everything you believe in. But it's still, as it is, a lot better than this regenerative thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Will Brinton said, regenerative is kindergarten, organic is high school. Not college, not graduate school. So we know that, that we have a long way to go, that, that we can do much better, but 
but organic is already doing a great deal. What about real organic? I mean, you know, I, I got you sitting in front of a real organic logo. Can we, can we talk about uh, organic as a movement and, and the need for organic to be a movement and not just a brand? Absolutely. Um, well, it started as a movement by folks like you and my parents who realized, who realized that a lot of the things they didn't like in society could be solved at a community level and, and the way to directly participate was to grow the food and to do so without the, my mother was the daughter of a weapons designer, you know, part of the very industrial complex uh, that you know, sort of led us down this road. Um, and that movement led to really vibrant conferences like we talked about earlier, uh, where, where the organic farmers themselves decided what was and wasn't allowed at the state level. And then when it became federal, uh, you know, the federal USDA program that oversaw the word organic, um, the economic movement grew, but I would say that was the beginning and the end of the social movement around organic. Um, which a lot of that social movement seems to have grown out of the, the Vietnam era and there, where there was a large social movement of people united together for a better, more peaceful world and way of life that was healthier uh, with more love for one another. And I, I, I don't call that the hippie movement. I think it was a much bigger movement and uh, the word hippie denigrates it. And what we need in organic now is a movement of people that we have, we have a tremendous uh, amount of our American population wants to feel better when they wake up every day. They don't want their kids to have some complicated weird disease or to be obese. Um, and they don't have anywhere to go for their movement. Now we're seeing their, th I do think they do. We need, you know, Real Organic Project is spreading a message of here's what organic really is about. Here's what it actually needs to be. And we want the USDA to do their job so that we, the people, have truly a healthy solution. And I think that the movement that needs to happen is one that crosses political lines where, where we can, because both sides, both parties are in on this uh, industrial agriculture game. Um, so we need a bipartisan, all-American effort to focus and really connect people that your own health is a reflection of the health of this planet right now and that we all need to feel better together. And there's a way we can farm and manage our land and work with our ecosystems that produces real organic food that's gonna make you really feel better. And I think that's the movement. And we really need to now join forces. A lot of us work in smaller groups or in smaller circles. And we need to, without losing our integrity, I feel join forces and really teach the public while applying pressure where we need to at the governmental level for change. Um, and the public then can force the markets and change, you know, that, those are the demanders, but we need to get to them. Yeah, yeah. You know, when we started the Real Organic Project, um, it was a time where th there was an organic movement, but it was so dispersed and actually, I think it was suffering from a deep state of depression that so much of what we believed in was just being washed away and people felt powerless. And after that, that final meeting in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, people were calling me in tears from around the country and just saying, it's over. And I thought, oh no, it's not over. You know, it, it might be that we can't look to the USDA to be our voice, our protector, but honestly, we never did. That, that was never, um, we didn't see, think that was the solution. And I think one of the things that's happening is people are going, yeah, we can do this ourselves. And, and that's what makes a movement. It is. It's, a movement is, is usually in the face of a government not doing its job or providing a key service, or people not feeling fulfilled and seeing an issue in front of them. And we have, Many of the movements we now we have now in the states, I would say, are deeply infiltrated or or driven by government or one party or the other, and the movement towards our own health and the health of our the lands we live on, is one that neither party has shown any real genuine interest in picking up for us. So we the people have a reason for a real movement right now. That's right. That's right. I, I 
I will say that I don't think it's just about government. I mean, no, no, we, it's about people. We have to, people. we've bought in to yeah. this system, and it's not working. So we need to buy into something else. Yeah, yeah. And we have our own responsibility to to ourselves and each other. Uh, and I think that that'll would have good impacts at the government level, actually. Yeah, right. So <laughs> it's it's called the trickle up theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, let me. I just want to visit a couple things before we go. Uh, one is, you know, people people do um, reach out and they say, I tried the roller crimper and it doesn't work. Obviously, it can work for some people, but I see a lot of people struggling to figure out even how to reduce tillage. And um, the information isn't great on how to do this that's, that's easily available. Yeah, it's... So I think the, the roller crimper, I've had great success with it, and I've had miserable failures with it. Uh, I've had zero bushel per acre soybeans, and I've had <laughs> 55 bushel per acre soybeans. I've had 150 bushel per acre organic corn, and we've had 24 bushel per acre organic corn. Um, and it's all about the conditions that you're working in. You can't just roll and crimp a cover crop and expect great results. It's about you have to roll and crimp a cover crop that's the right size, the, the, that's at the right point in its maturity so that you kill it effectively with few enough weeds already established under it that you know that, it's, that there isn't enough weed pressure to really worry about so your corn's going to outrun those. It's even trickier with soybeans. Um, also, depending on where you are and your amount of rainfall, you need to be careful about what soil types you roll and crimp on and what types you don't. Um, so I found that is, it'd be too long of an answer to give a, you know, a monologue on what does and doesn't work. But we found that it can work and it's a useful tool to have in the arsenal. Um, but it's not something an organic farm can depend on. Yeah. It's a tool. It's a tool. It's yeah. one of one more tool that you park and it, and when, when, when provided a great opportunity, you can use it for some great no-till applications. Right. But I also still think most organic farms are going to need to have a plow or an offset disc or want another tillage implement or, or a few of them around because yeah. um, you can't just use one. Yeah. Great. Um, so b before we, we end, I, I feel that we ought to just touch about um, meat and lab meat and and um, this strange thing where our whole food system is, is becoming almost unrecognizable. Uh, you know, I don't know what percentage of the berries now are hydroponic, but a lot. And uh, that wasn't something that would have even been thought of as food a hundred years ago. It's a, it's a new thing. It, it requires plastic to work. You know, the whole technology is built on plastic. You've got to have all these drip tubes and all this stuff. So I'm curious about um, Impossible Burgers and lab meat and what do you, what do you think about that? Is this, is this uh, a solution to a problem? I don't think so, I'll be really frank. Lab meat for the most part so far has been a feedstock, usually soybeans, fed to microbes who eat the soy and excrete the lab meat. So you're basically eating microbes. Um, personally, I'd rather just not eat meat, but other people want to have something that tastes like meat. The, I think that the com this is a symptom of a greater problem, is that we Americans and the industrializing world, we eat too much meat. And we eat crappy meat. And we eat lots of it. And that's not good for us or our ecosystem, or our whole climate. But that animals, to say, to throw the baby out with the bathwater is not possible because animals are an integral part of any ecosystem. They play a key role. And in an organic agro-ecosystem or an organic farm, one of, and traditionally all the way until just after World War II, or a little bit in the run-up to it or really after it, our primary nutrient source was manure from animals and from humans. Uh, all around the world was the primary, we recycled those nutrients to grow our food. So 
and that we got to eat our protein source was also the fertility source. You know, the animals provide the eggs or the milk or the meat that provide us with protein and their excrement provided the fertility to grow our vegetables. So the, we now have such a complicated social environment where vegans can say they're here to save the world. And we have opponents of our movement, um, like Bayer, Monsanto, others, who are like, great, vegans, that's a great market for our no-till soybeans. We can talk up soybeans here. Or you have, so we have a very complicated social fabric on, that was just an example, and I have friends who are vegans who I respect and love, and I tried it myself. Um, so don't, it's not a personal attack on anyone, my statement there. It's an example of how we have a society built on free choice to such an extent that we have a sort of proliferation of new ideas, and we now have a neoliberal mindset of freedom of communication, unless you say certain things, uh, f free, you know, you know, freedom to assembly, but on a tech platform. And we kind of get this group think going on. Oh, meat's the enemy, meat's bad. Milk's the enemy, milk's bad. So let's create it in a lab. And technology is good, but only if it's used for things we agree in. Twitter was good before, it's bad now that Elon Musk owns it. Okay. Um, so, these, all these ex so I think that we're in a very charged environment where people's belief in technological solutions, media latching onto this idea, but what I think we're really supporting with fake meat is a very, to me, controversial and dangerous slippery slope where our food is made in the same type of labs that make a lot of the medicines that have turned out to be very unhealthy for us by a, gro a group of actors that are almost more one and the same. Bayer makes medical things, but they also run agrochemicals. And now the soybeans coming out of that are the basis for a lab meat. And if something happens to us when we eat the lab meat, who's accountable? So to me, the whole thing is very dubious, and we really need to talk about the source of the issue, which is, agreed, we, have, we eat too much meat. We have a meat addiction to cheap meat. But that meat banning it is like, is like saying, well, we don't need any animals in nature. Agriculture has co-evolved with animals for thousands and thousands of years, and we now have the tools to do it better. So I think we should be much more focused on using animal manure in a much more sensible way, optimizing it, and using our biological prowess instead of to make microbes that can shit out soybeans into a burger, um, maybe to produce more nitrogen in our soil so we don't have nitrous oxide problems. Yeah. Maybe understand what microbes those already are because we have it in our compost. We don't need to invent them. We just need to know how to make the right compost to produce the nitrogen we need, etc. So I think that it's, a, it's a treating a symptom of a problem as opposed to addressing a root cause, the entire fake meat movement. Great. One last question. Maybe, uh, I think. We've discussed that article in Nature that was came to the startling conclusion that conventional agriculture was better for the planet than organic agriculture because it got higher yields per acre and thus you could grow the food on fewer acres and thus you could have more undisturbed forest land sequestering carbon. I'm just curious, we, we've talked about it, I'd, I'd really like to revisit it for, to share with other people. Some of your reactions to that, that sure. argument. And my first reaction I'm going to start with is, uh, is an honest one. Um, having farmed organically my whole life, organic grain systems yield less grain than conventional ones. That's from a perspective of looking at land that produced for 50 to 100 years. Um, I think it's pretty easy to argue that certain lands have visited at a certain point. I've seen it in my own county. They just can't produce grain anymore because they've gotten fertilized and eroded to death. So they're just hay fields now. Um, that being said, that article in Nature was very problematic because it didn't, again, address um, some of the key root questions. Like what does, most of the U what does the U.S. corn crop do and what is it used for? Well, 20 40 per, to 40 percent of it goes to ethanol at a net loss of energy and a net loss of taxpayer dollars. That's a bipartisan effort. It goes in your car where it causes damage to the engines. 
It's bad fuel. So my first answer would be, why don't we just not do ethanol? And that's that much less corn acreage, conventional or organic. We export a tremendous amount of our food. Um, and, and the list goes on and on and on. So I don't think we need to be talking about yields. I think, again, we need to be talking about um, some key pillars of health, ecological health, human health, and then I'm going to go to this, which is cultural health, which is where that frame of mind is already from a frame of mind that the world is talking about corn and soybeans and wheat. And that that's kind of when we're looking at it, we can produce enough of that using conventional agriculture to feed this world's growing population. Maybe, but it hasn't happened yet. Because culturally and internationally, there are wars, there are conflicts, there's famine in my, my wife's home country of Haiti, and that's only 600 miles from Miami. There's no shortage of corn and soy up here, but apparently they can't get fed. So I don't buy that argument for a minute because we have tremendous overproduction of agricultural, quote, commodities that aren't even being eaten by anybody. It's being turned into fuel at a loss. We have tremendous tracts of land in countries like Jamaica that are go unused because they import all the grain. And when COVID hit, no one could afford food. So culturally, and normally, they wouldn't be eating a corn and soy-based diet. So all around the world, there's a tremendous opportunity for the return of culture to the word ag, agriculture, where people re-embrace the foods they've grown traditionally, the areas they live, their own ecosystem, and take their own security of, uh, uh, from famine into their own hands by producing food. Um, and to do so independently, you need to do it organically so you're not dependent on imported synthetic fertilizers or GMO seeds, etc. And in areas where we see these types of movement happening, we see flourishing local communities again. So I think that nature's argument is very much a, uh, you know, an Anglo-centric idea that, you know, he who controls the food supply controls countries, he who controls energy supply controls continents, he controls money supply controls the world. That was Henry Kissinger's view, and it very much defines how the U.S. operates. And I think the only way we see that we can control countries with our food supply is to do so with conventionally grown food. Mm. All right. Any last thing you want to say, Ben, before we close up? I'll leave it with that. All right. <laughs> that was great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you'll subscribe and share the link with your friends. Please take the time today to leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to so that others can find us. A video version of this interview is found at realorganicproject.org and by following our YouTube channel. Please join us next time when our guest will be Alan Lewis, a food and policy expert from Natural Grocers, who always enlightens us with his expertise on the distribution and consolidation challenges that organic farmers are facing in the marketplace. Alan was among the 50 thought leaders we interviewed to discuss the co-opting of both regenerative and climate farming in our recent online symposia. You can find tickets to the recordings at realorganicsymposium.org.